Ena mana ene hoe fa tena koto kato, no mai hara mai. E korana tenako kua tai mai koto kita fakanui e te popa kopapa o te ra, no rera e akuranga tira tena koto tena koto tena koto kato. Thanks very much for coming to Survivor Head of School, um, <laughs> and, and, and for Greg for his um, very very warm welcome. Just before I start, I'd like to um, make some acknowledgements, if I can. First of all, to my colleagues in history, I have been here for quite a long time, and I've had the best colleagues, the most supportive colleagues, and to people in Tapuna Aranui, the School of Humanities, and my colleagues in the Faculty of Arts, Takura Tangata. It's been a wonderful place to work, and I hope it continues to be that way for some time to come, but I've been so blessed to have wonderful colleagues. I'd like to acknowledge, too, the academic leaders that I've had since I've come to Auckland. Professor Ray Raymond Dalziel, who picked me up half a lifetime ago at Auckland Airport and um, welcomed me to Auckland. And since that time, both as heads of departments and deans of arts, and also in management within the university, there's been a wonderful group of people who've been so supportive of the things that I've wanted to do. And um, it's just made Auckland a special place. Um, there's some students and former students here, and I'd like to welcome you. I often say that students are so essential to what we do. They provide the sort of vitality, the energy that keeps us going as researchers. And to all of you, welcome. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge and welcome my family and friends for coming along um, to hear me talk about something that they hear about a lot, which is um, the story of Irish migration. So. Um, what I want to do is really explain what, who I am and what I do, and to talk about what I'd like to do in the future. So um, this evening I'd like to talk about Irish immigration and Australian bigotry. Each year when we historians advertise our research topics to prospective postgraduate students, I realise that my interests in Australia and Ireland don't fit easily in our traditional groupings of European or US or New Zealand history. I'm best categorised as other. And so, with your indulgence, I'd like to spend some time explaining how and why someone who is Australian by birth, resides in New Zealand, and is not Irish, spends so much time talking and writing about Ireland and the migration of Irish people. I also hope a quick journey back down the time tunnel will help explain why the history of immigration is important to me, and show the way that my experiences as a young uh, adult in Australia shape my interest in migrants and their reception. It's a story with some detours and distractions along the way. But in some ways, I think, tonight's topic takes me back full circle to my original decision to study history. Bear with me, we'll come back to that in just a little while. Growing up as a teenager in Sydney in the 1970s was to bear witness to significant societal changes, not just the introduction of colour TV, FM radio and fast food outlets. In April 1976, refugee boats from Vietnam, like this one, the Kian Guang, began arriving regularly in the Australian northern port of Darwin. Following soon after the occupation of Ho Chi Minh City, or Saigon, in April 1975 by the North Vietnamese Army, the arrival of newcomers from Asia on Australia's northern shores marked a critical moment in the history of Australian immigration. The abolition of the last formal vestiges of the notorious White Australia policy during the period of the Whitlam government from 1972 to 1975, meant the abandonment of racial preference in Australia's immigration policy. The adoption of a policy of multiculturalism in lieu of the previous strict assimilation and later integration regimes portended significant changes in Australia's population composition, national identity and economic orientation. Following so soon after the reform of migration and settlement policies, the reality of newcomers from Asia arriving direct and unannounced in Northern Australia proved unsettling to many people, rekindling deeply held anxieties about Australia's place in the world, its proximity to Asia, and the so-called yellow peril to Australia's north. As political debates mounted from the late 1970s about Australian immigration and settlement policies, Historians began, unsurprisingly, to address in a new and sustained way, and in a more meaningful way, the continent's experience of migration. The author Geoffrey Sherrington's book, Australia's Immigrants, 
1788 to 1978, published in 1980, initiated a series of developments in migration scholarship that included Professor James Jupp's establishment of a Centre for Immigration and Multicultural Studies at the Australian National University, and later in that decade, his ambitious Encyclopedia of the Australian People, published to coincide with the bicentenary of European occupation of Australia. While some historians made important contributions to the study of migration and helped inform public policy, regrettable interventions inflamed public fears of newcomers and fuel demands for the curtailment of this new Asian migration. Melbourne University professor Geoffrey Blaney, one of the most prominent historians in Australia at the time, well known for his television series The Blaney View, emerged as a key critic of Asian migration. Blaney's prominence was such that my parents gave me his book, this book, based on the television series as a Christmas present, the only history book that they ever gave me. Now, they did give me books. It wasn't that we were a bookless household, but this is the only history book um, that I recall them giving me, and I was able to fish it out and scan the cover. <laughs> His opposition to Australia's immigration policy became a matter of public record when he addressed a Rotary Club conference in Western, the Western Victorian town of Warrnambool, significantly for our purposes, on St Patrick's Day, March 1984. Blaney expressed concern that the pace of Asian immigration is now far ahead of public opinion. He believed that the Australian government was jeopardising the remarkable gains in tolerance and understanding slowly built up in Australia over the last third of a century. Through its ill-advised immigration policy, and he compared the Hawke Labor government's stand on immigration with the discarded and discredited White Australia policy. To quote Blaney, the flaw in the old White Australia policy was its arrogance, its insensitivity, its lack of proportion. The flaw in this new immigration policy is its arrogance, its insensitivity to a large section of the Australian population. Blaney's speech was a calculated and deliberate one. In it, he articulated doubts that, he claimed, had been germinating for several years. Soon after, Blaney published a potboiler entitled All for Australia. The book's cavalier combination of sweeping assertions and personal anecdotes makes recapitulation of its arguments a difficult task. However, the central tenets of Blaney's book were that immigration in its policy in Australia had fallen wildly out of step with Australian public opinion, that it was controlled by a clique of left-wing politicians, bureaucrats and trade union officials who manipulated the figures, that it deviated widely from Australia's prior experience of immigration, and that the lessons of history supported his judgment that the policy of non-racially selective immigration that was being pursued posed a threat to the future unity of Australian society. Implicit in Blaney's argument in All for Australia was the view that recent Asian immigrants, a group characterised by national, cultural and religious diversity, were collectively incompatible with the future maintenance of Australia's democratic institutions, the nation's values, and were unable to fully participate in a society where English was the dominant language. Yet ironically, he maintained that few were now prouder of Australia than its post-Second World War European immigrants, from such well-known pre-war democracies as Germany and Italy. Blaney's use and misuse of statistics, his theoretical analysis of race, and his assertions as to the lessons of history were problematic in varying degrees. Their combined effect, whatever Blaney's exact motivations, was to unleash a strident backlash against immigrants and multiculturalism, and to give oxygen to right-wing groups such as the League of Rights and National Action. Despite efforts by other historians to combat Blaney's arguments, the genie was out of the bottle, and through the late 1970s and early 1980s, a period of high unemployment and economic uncertainty in Australia, its life, including life on university campuses, exhibited wounds from racism and from xenophobia. These developments coincided with my introduction to student life at the University of New South Wales. Um, an institution that hosted a large and diverse international student body and where anti-immigrant -graf graffiti soon appeared on the walls. And it did provoke, I'm pleased to say, um, levels of student protest. And I was able to dig out from the student newspaper, Tharunka, recently, 
uh, a rally that was on campus against the inaction of the then Vice, uh, Vice Chancellor, Michael Burt. He was known as Blowfly Burt because his PhD had been on, as I recall, the wings of blowflies. But, <laughs> but, but, but nevertheless, there was a good degree of action against the racism that was appearing, but, but it was certainly there and, um, and present. Not knowing what I was doing, I enrolled in an arts law conjoint and to the extent that I envisaged any post-study future, it was as a political correspondent based in Canberra. I was really interested in Australian politics. I didn't enjoy first year political science at all, I'm afraid, but I did relish a course on, uh, the course on 19th century Australian history, the first year course. There were entertaining lecturers, including a predecessor of mine in the Australian Post at Auckland, in fact, the first person to teach Australian history at Auckland, um, David Walker, who still remains the funniest lecture, lecturer that I've ever seen. I had a terrific tutor in first year, Dr Gail Pearson. The tutorial was Wednesday at noon in her office adjacent to the library lawn. And each week our classes discussed the 19th century past while Australian pub bands did sound checks outside for their 1pm start on the steps of the Menzies Library. As some people here know, it was at UNSW that I saw the little known and forgettable pub band formerly known as the Cockroaches before they changed their name to the Wiggles and became international stars. I wrote essays on Russian history whenever I could. In third year, I took an undergraduate course on the Irish in Australia, taught by the late Greymouth-born historian Patrick O'Farrell. I chose it either because it was time for me to circle back to Australian history after having sampled courses on Europe, the United States and the Middle East, or because of the timetabling. I really don't recall. Either way, it had a big impact on my future. Patrick's course was an excellent example of research-based teaching and a model of why this nexus should be at the heart of any university's mission. The lectures were memorable ones based on pre-publication excerpts of his landmark book, The Irish in Australia, replete with all of the musings and dilemmas of professional historians at work. The course also introduced me to Patrick's quirkier, more mischievous side when I was confronted with an examination question at the end of the semester, proposing, as best I recall, that the course had been an extravagance utilising sparse resources that could have been better devoted to doing something else. I thought it was a bravely provocative question, and I decided um, it was an obvious question to answer. Fortunately, I passed the course. <laughs> Goodbye law degree. That course gave me a direction for postgraduate study and a future PhD topic an opportunity to study Australian immigration without the intimidating language demands of researching more recent Italian or Greek or Vietnamese immigrants. For the 19th century Irish in Australia, my English was sufficient. Influenced in part by the famous French uh, historians known as the Annales School, I set out to write for my PhD a regional study of an Irish rural community in Australia, attempting a fine-grained investigation of community life of the kind that also became associated with explorations in microhistory. I took as a particular focus a Tipperary born a convict, Edward Ned Ryan, pictured on the left, who was transported to New South Wales in 1816 among a group of white boys, rural protesters so called for their white smocks, in which they undertook violent nocturnal raids in the Munster countryside, protesting the effects of the tithe and the commercialisation of agriculture in Ireland in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. My research on Ryan, who was known locally as the King of Galon Castle, uh, and of his immediate community, showed the propensity of the Irish in the colonial uh, Australia in the middle of the 19th century for rural life, particularly in the southwestern uh, region of New South Wales, the adaptability of Catholic and Protestant Irish to the conditions they encountered there, and the deliberate attempts by the Irish in Australia to assert their position as representative political institutions developed in the new society. Moments of tension and conflict undoubtedly occurred in this rural region, particularly from the late 1850s. However, in the main, the socio-economic opportunities and post-arrival experiences of these Irish newcomers didn't diverge widely from that of their neighbours, English or Scots, 
and they showed a strong interest in building harmonious community relations, excluding, one should say, Indigenous Australians. And this is a map, and it might be difficult to see, but on the bottom right is um, the land that Ryan occupied, which was reputed in the local mind to be the size of Ireland itself. And this strong uh, image developed about the size of his kingdom and the massive wealth that he amassed. While the experiences of the Irish were my principal concern, this Australian case study raised some new questions to explore. At the time I wrote, the weight of international scholarship, which was principally American writing about the Irish, indicated that the concept of a moderately prosperous and well-adjusted rural Irish immigrant was an oxymoron. Numerous books and articles were adamant that upon leaving Ireland, the Irish were transformed from a rural people to a city people. Ill-equipped for extensive agriculture, lacking in capital, reliant on gregarious communities, psychologically scarred by the Great Famine, and possessing a mentality that made him or her passive recipients of fate, the rural Irish emigrant disembarked in the New World as an urban immigrant. It was these characteristics, some being treated dangerously as innate traits, that saw Irish Americans become pioneers of the urban ghetto. In a good deal of the historical writing, only upon the election of John F. Kennedy were the Irish Americans finally liberated from their history of subordination and despair. This set me off on a detour. I felt compelled to investigate the disjunction between my Australian-based findings and most of the international scholarship of the time. Good Fortune saw me receive a Fulbright Award and I was soon off to the American Midwest, which was an eye-opener in its own right, to investigate this conundrum. A year at the University of Missouri working with the excellent and ever-generous historian Kirby Miller offered an opportunity to read deeply on the American Irish. Comparative history provided an approach to explore differences in the history and the historiography, in the lived experience but in what writing had been done. If I were to try and summarise my findings, I'd say that US historians correctly identified the 19th century Irish in America as predominantly an urban people, though their explanations for this phenomenon proved to be mainly erroneous. Time of arrival, the structural challenges of the mid-19th century American economy, and the intense nativist hostility of the mid-century all prove more influential than any innate characteristics of the Irish migrants themselves. At the same time, it goes without saying that there was not one American Irish experience. I became interested in subnational historical comparisons and realised that Irish immigrants did settle on the land in places like Minnesota and Wisconsin, while others tra traversed the continent from the 1840s to occupy land adjacent to the Pacific coast. In some of these locations, the immigrants did fare well, particularly if their decisions to settle on the land were supported by modest sums of capital and underpinned by individual or family decisions to move westward and to farm. In contrast, several contrived schemes to recruit ill-prepared and capital-poor Irish for Western settlement proved disastrous and fueled perceptions about the inadequacy of the Irish for farming and new world conditions. Then a sort of new historical byway loomed. In the course of investigating the Irish in the United States and Australia, I discovered the surprising extent of mobility and exchange between the Irish born on either side of the Pacific Ocean and the levels of interaction of the Irish within the broad Pacific world. I'll illustrate this with one example. In 1852, around the time of the Californian gold rush, fewer than 10% of San Francisco's Irish born were direct immigrants from Ireland. The greatest number of Irish born had previously resided elsewhere in the United States before moving to the West Coast, and this is not surprising. However, their numbers did not greatly exceed the number of Irish born who sailed across the Pacific Ocean from the Australian colonies and New Zealand to seek their fortunes on the Californian gold fields. How to account for these mobile people, or the Irish nationalists who in the latter decades of the 19th century undertook missions that spanned this oceanic space? or the Irish missionaries who operated through the Pacific from the late 18th century, or the Irish Republicans who mobilised in Sydney and Melbourne and tried to achieve connection with militant compatriots in California following Ireland's 1916 Easter Rising. 
This led to a new project, influenced by developments in oceanic world history, to try and write a history of the Irish through the Pacific world. As anyone here who's heard me talk on this to topic before knows well, um, it proved to be a larger, more complex, and much more time consuming venture than I'd ever imagined. Notwithstanding my forays into comparative and transnational histories, interest in the day-to-day -day experiences of migrants has continued to be a common motif in my work, and issues of prejudice and discrimination remain very much at the heart of my research. With the completion of Ireland's Farthest Shores, my attentions returned full circle to the question of Australia's reception of immigrants and the broader issue of bigotry in its national life. For if in the 1970s and 1980s the new arrivals aroused political controversy and experienced hostility and discrimination, those same characteristics indelibly marked the island continent from the moment of European occupation, and certainly in its reception of the Irish. It's on that experience, Irish immigration and Australian intolerance, that I'd like to focus for the remainder of tonight's lecture, setting out part of an agenda for future work on the wider history of bigotry in Australia. And as many people have um, casually remarked, it might prove to be a very big book. First, what do I mean by bigotry? Initially used in the 17th century in a religious context to describe an obstinate or unreasonable attachment to a belief, the word bigotry's meaning has extended over time to include prejudice and intolerance towards individuals and groups on a wider array of grounds, including race, ethnicity, gender, sexual preference, and even disability. For present purposes, the focus will be predominantly on bigotry's impact in the often intersecting fields of race, ethnicity, ethnicity and religion. Now, it's important to emphasise that the objective of my work is not to rate Australia's experience of bigotry, It'd probably score pretty highly, but that's um, really not what I want to do, or to offer a judgement about whether the nation's history of prejudice and discrimination is better or worse than those of other nations. Instead, my aim is to understand better the historical experience of bigotry and what I perceive to be the discernible peaks and troughs in Australia's intolerance towards different population groups to explore the periodisation of those shifts in momentum and to investigate whether a model or paradigm can be developed that helps us understand the experience of the groups most subjected to bigotry in Australian life. Significant questions include whether specific conditions in colonial national life in Australia shaped a distinctive form of bigotry, bigotry Australian style, and whether, and if so, why, at certain historical moments, particular population groups bore the brunt of intolerance and discrimination. So uh, let's go on to the Irish in more detail. One doesn't need to read uh, far into the records of early colonial Australia to encounter bigotry towards the Irish. Australia's first immigrant minority. On the 12th of November, 1796, the New South Wales governor, John Hunter, wrote to the Duke of Portland bemoaning the behaviour of the Irish convicts who'd been sent to the colony on the transport ships Boddington and Sugarcane. To quote him, I have at this moment an information upon oath before me of a very serious nature and in which those turbulent and worthless characters called Irish defenders are concerned. At a time when purposeful labourers were required, Hunter received these Irish convicts horrid characters who I confess I wish had either been sent to the coast of Africa or some other place fit for them. Matters didn't improve in the following 12 months. In January 1798, the governor warned London, if so large a proportion of these lawless and turbulent people, the Irish convicts, are sent to this country, it will be sca scarcely be possible to maintain the order so highly essential to our well-being. Those that we've received, received from that country within the last year have completely ruined those uh, for whom we'd formerly received from England, who, although extremely bad, were by no means equal in infamy and turbulence to these others. Events in 1798 reinforced the colonial administration's antagonism to new arrivals from Ireland. The United Irish Risings of that year ambitiously sought to transform Irish politics and loosen shackles on religious and economic freedom. They foreshadowed the abolition of the Irish Parliament in 
and Ireland's incorporation into the United Kingdom. It also produced a large pool of dissidents to be punished. The prisoners transported to Australia following Ireland's Year of Liberty were a group that ranged from genteel, well-accomplished individuals influenced by the ideals of the French Revolution to poor rural labourers. Initially, the new governor, Philip Gidley King, saw some signs of quality among the newcomers, but his enthusiasm for them quickly waned. King reported to his masters in London that artful and designing wretches were at work to undermine authority and stability within the colony. Religious and cultural differences, as well as fears of sedition, fueled the Irish anti-Irish anti sentiment in these early colonial years. The official chaplain of the First Fleet, the Reverend Richard Johnson, was an Anglican of evangelical leanings nominated for his post by, among others, William Wilberforce. Johnson struggled with the sinfulness of his charges and the undoubted burdens of his misery. He returned to England in 1800 after 12 years of service in the colony. His successor was Samuel Marsden. Marsden shared with many fellow Englishmen a disdain for Irish Catholics and the convict population's criminal status doubled their offence. He was sure that these were wild, ignorant and savage men whose presence threatened the future of the colony. Roman religion for Marsden was idolatrous and in the convict colony merely served as a front for rebelliousness. As one historian explained, Marsden's vision uh, for the future of the society was of, an ex one, sorry, of, was of a one religion state, exclusively Protestant, with Roman Catholicism and its attendant mischief bred out of the next generation of colonial children through education and active conversion. The question is why were colonial authorities so perturbed by this? One inescapable characteristic of late 18th century um, Australian life, and indeed I think this might be a longer term characteristic, is fearfulness. Great Britain's loss of its American colonies, the disruption and dislocation of early industrialism and revolution in France, each contributed to a deep sense of anxiety. Unrest in Ireland during the years of the Atlantic revolutions added to the list of domestic and international challenges confronting Britain. The establishment of the United Irish Society in October 1791, Wolfe Tone's powerful proclamation of the aims of the movement, and the Society's advocacy of religious equality prefaced the active mobilisation of its members in Belfast and in Dublin. The outbreak of war between Britain and France in 1793 cast the United Irishmen's demands in a new and very threatening light. And in May 1794, active suppression of the movement began. From 1797, General Gerard Lake led a campaign in which political prisoners were detained and thousands of weapons were seized. As much scholarship attests, 1798 witnessed uprisings in the north and the south and the west of Ireland that proved unsuccessful in the short term but which profoundly shaped the future of modern Irish history. The establishment of the penal settlement at Sydney Cove magnified in an, antipod in an antipodean setting the increasing le level of apprehension in Britain. Distance, isolation, uh, uncertainty and want shaped from the very beginning the character of early Australian colonial society and the outlooks of its governors, who initially were all naval officers. This aura of anxiety, rather than any optimistic vision of a greater colonial destiny, defined the early years of the Australian project. So too did the divisions in the convict settlement's national and religious identity. Though a new British identity arguably was in the making, that process remained incomplete when Governor Arthur Phillips stepped ashore at Sydney Cove in January 1788. Political instability in Ireland inhibited this project at home, but also in the Australian setting. The Act of Union, which took effect on the first day of the new century, responded to recent insurgency in Ireland by creating the United Parliament for Great Britain and Ireland at Westminster. Though Catholic emancipation featured in the aims of many of the proponents of this union, King George III refused steadfastly to entertain the measure that promised all subjects 
within the union equal religious standing. Defective from its very inception by this failure to address religious inequality, the deep resentment at the heart of the union took hold in early colonial Australia. In August 1801, King, as acting governor, organised an observance to celebrate the happy union of Great Britain and Ireland. I've often wondered what the Irish convicts thought about this. Assembled convicts watched the ceremony that included the firing of cannons from shore batteries and ships and other demonstrations of joy, as the record puts it. King marked the moment with some acts of clemency, releasing several Irish prisoners and seeking clarification from London about the extent of his power to grant further pardons. However, the celebration of the Union at Sydney heralded no rapid transformation in the standing of the Irish in the new colony. In fact, tensions mounted further, especially following the 1804 rising at Castle Hill, in which resentful colleagues, convicts, attempted to march on Sydney under the united Irish cry, death or liberty. Given the prejudice towards Irish Catholicism in the United Kingdom, it was little wonder that Roman Catholicism in New South Wales experienced an inauspicious start. The first Catholic priests in New South Wales arrived as prisoners, transported, ordered for their involvement in the 1798 rebellion. Their ministries proved short-lived. However, the level of intolerance towards the Irish, especially Irish Catholics, interestingly did not remain constant. Animosity diminished markedly in the second quarter of the 19th century. A number of factors, international and domestic, contributed to the decline of bigotry at this time. The coming of the peace in Europe, relative political stability in Ireland, and I mean relative political stability, and growth in the size and confidence of the colonial settlement diminished the anxiety that had attended the colony's earliest years. Importantly, the passage through the British Parliament of the Roman Catholic Relief Act in 1829 set in train reforms that promoted Irish Catholic interests throughout the empire. In the case of New South Wales, two prominent Irish Catholics were appointed to significant positions in the colony soon after the passage of the emancipation legislation. Roger Terry arrived in 1829 as Commissioner of the Court of Requests. John Hubert Plunkett followed soon after in 1832 as the New South Wales Attorney General. Both new arrivals had strong connection to the leader of Ireland's successful campaign for Catholic recognition, Daniel O'Connell, pictured in, um, on the shoulders of someone um, and uh, celebrating the Catholic ascendancy. At this time too, a new governor was appointed to the colony, Richard Burke, born in Dublin in 1777 to a Protestant family with land holdings in Limerick and in Tipperary. Daniel O'Connell's reported to have rejoiced upon hearing the news of Burke's appointment as governor. Within the space of just a few years, several important posts in the principal Australian colony fell into the Irish hands. And within a short time, the religious climate of colonial society began to undergo significant change. As important as these new appointments were, Suspicion of the Irish and opposition to the Roman Catholic Church didn't quite disappear. It was maintained in a more passive manner than before through the episcopacy of William Grant Broughton, Bishop of the Church of England in Australia from 1836 until 1852. However, the Anglican Bishop's hopes of exclusivity for his religion um, were thwarted. Legislatively, the position of the Irish Catholic population changed with the most significant reform of Richard Burke's governorship, the Church Act of June 1836. The new act remained in force until 1862, so it's a central piece of legislation through the middle of the 19th century. And it legislated for the provision of state assistance to all the major religious denominations in New South Wales relative to their number of adherents. The move which directed state funding to support Roman Catholic institutions effectively stripped the Church of England of any claim to superior standing in the colony. Though subject to attack, the controversial law survived as an important liberal measure, instituted by men experienced in the sectarian calumnies of Irish life 
and eager that those old world divisions should not be repeated in New Australia. The Act set a tone of general state disinterest in doctrinal matters that was to prove resilient in 19th century Australia, and I'd argue for a much longer time too. Significantly, the Irish-born played an assertive role in campaigning for the removal of a series of civil restrictions that impaired and threatened to uh, affect the opportunities of ex-convicts, Irish and non-Irish alike, including the right to sit on local councils and plans to perpetuate civil distinctions and convict standing in the census enumeration. So they fought against the idea that having been a convict would be marked in the census for perpetuity. By the mid-19th century, the bigotry of the early colonial years appeared greatly diminished. The high proportion of Irish born in the colonial population, their distribution through the colony, all supported more congenial relations with their neighbours that tended, than tended to be the case in other parts of the Irish diaspora. The rural bias of Irish settlement, achieved at a great cost to Indigenous Australians who were forced from their lands, produced bonds of dependency in the mid-19th century that supported more harmonious community life than predominated in those major international cities where Irish migrants concentrated in large numbers. Indeed, for some, Ireland had retreated to a sort of nostalgia. On St Patrick's Day 1840, the Catholic newspaper, the Australasian Chronicle, in a widely circula circulated editorial, asks where shall we look on this 17th day of March for proof that Irishmen have not forgot their country, save in the tavern and the tap room. The answer, in large part, was that they were making Australian lives. Yet, despite that promising scenario, respite from bigotry proved to be short-lived. Historians have recognised Henry James O'Farrell's attempted assassination of Prince Alfred during the first royal tour of Australia to mark a turning point for community tolerance towards the Irish. The shooting in Sydney on the 12th of March 1868 took place in the midst of a worldwide panic over the rise of Fenianism. Invasions of Canada by Irish American Fenians in April and May 1866 and subsequent violent actions in Britain aroused local fears over the global reach of physical force Irish nationalism. And this is a picture of the Battle of Ridgeway in Canada with Irish in their ex-Civil War uniforms, both from the Union and the Confederacy, um, crossing off the border. So this was one of a couple of raids made into Canada by uh, Irish. And there was a big division among uh, radical Irish Republicans about the strategy to go to Ireland and uh, exert force there directly or to think about any way that you could attack Britain. And from the United States invading Canada was one of the things that they tried. The allegation that Henry James O'Farrell, the assassin in Sydney, recently cast out from a Roman Catholic seminary, had shouted, I'm a Fenian, God save Ireland, as he shot the prince in the back, provoked a political outcry in New South Wales, as you can imagine. Determined to demonstrate its loyalty to the Crown, the colonial parliament passed legislation to outlaw activities it regarded as seditious, and this law was used against protesting Irish. The O'Farrell furore signalled a fracturing of the goodwill generated in the previous three decades. The deepening national and sectarian divisions showed in the rallying of Irish Catholics and their Protestant rivals into competing camps. On the Irish side, a recently arrived clique of Irish bishops, protégés of the leading 19th century Irish churchman, Cardinal Paul Cullen, made their mark in the 1860s. These new bishops brought a willingness to deploy Irish nationalism to rally their congregations, adopted uncompromising positions on key political questions, including education, and showed a determination to stand firm in the face of increasing opposition. Their incendiary tone was soon criticised by those more seasoned to colonial life. Writing after the installation of one of these new bishops, William Lanigan, who became Bishop of Goulburn in 1867, the English-born Roman Catholic Archbishop of Sydney, John B. Polding, warned a conf confident that the attitude adopted by the new generation of Irish church leaders might have suited the streets of Dublin, but in Australia was sadly out of place. In a similar vein, welcoming the new year in 1869, 
Melbourne's Advocate newspaper remarked that those who perpetuated sectarian division in the Australian colonies were out of date and out of place. Regrettably, the newspaper's optimism proved unfounded. Protestants responded to the, to the tumult of the 1860s by forming their own organisations, including the Protestant Political Association, which by the late 1870s could count on around one in seven males under six, over 16 as a member, the Loyal Orange Order, which traced its roots to late 18th century Ulster, also grew quickly in Australia in the decades after O'Farrell's attempt on the Prince's life. While fierce Athenians undoubtedly played a role in igniting the more incendiary environment from 1866, so narrow a focus on the spectre of physical force Irish nationalism fails, in my opinion, to adequately explain the deterioration in community relations at this time. With the limited time available, and we do want to get to a drink, um, I'd like to highlight just two additional factors. The first is the increasing level of Irish immigration to Australia and to the Australian colonies that coincides with this upsurge of activity. In fact, the three decades, 1850 to 1880, marked the peak years of migration from Ireland to Australia. It was very extensive at the time. Almost a quarter of a million Irish emigrated for Australia and New Zealand during that uh, three decade period. Second, the surge in intolerance had occurred at a time of significant demographic and economic change. In Eastern Australia, the 1870s marked the beginning of a wave of expansion in manufacturing, with a near doubling in the numbers of Australians employed in industry between 1870 and 1880. With this economic orientation came an increase in the proportion of uh, the population resident in urban areas. Whereas in 1871, 46% of the population in New South Wales was resident in urban areas, by 1881, 58% of the colony's population lived in major cities or towns. Most of that increase occurred in the capital city, Sydney, where the population increased by nearly 300% between 1861 and 1881. In Victoria, the proportion of the colonial population in urban areas also rose substantially in the 1860s, and the population of Melbourne continued to rise through the 1870s. Even the smaller Australian cities experienced this change in settlement at the time. Together, escalating numbers of immigrants, fast-paced urbanisation, and rapid change in colonial Australians' ways of living created conditions that were ripe for the escalation of anti-Irish sentiment and advocacy of discriminatory measures. Not too much more to go. Um, relations between the Irish and their Australian neighbours remained volatile for decades to come. The flammable mixture of Irish nationalism and Roman Catholicism needed little to ignite it during the 1880s and the 1890s. Later, the 1916 Easter Rising in Dublin and bitter debates over conscription for war service raised fresh concerns about the loyalty of the Irish and new warnings of the threat posed to national life by their presence. The perception of the Irish as turbulent and worthless characters proved an extraordinarily difficult one to erase and continued well into the 20th century. So why do I think this is important? As a postgraduate student, I hope that the study of immigrants would contribute to a more tolerant society and challenge the bigotry that was so prevalent at the time. I still hold that hope. The need remains the same. In his 2020 Australian Day message, the former Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, said, whether our families came here tens of thousands of years ago, generations ago, as mine did on the first fleet, or those who are taking citizenship today, we're all together as one, and we can all be proud. Morrison's affirmation of national unity wasn't an unusual one, but it is a historical. Whether in the treatment of its First Nations peoples, its national or religious minorities, including the Irish, or many other groups, Australia's past has not been characterised by unity and cohesion. Bigotry has been an enduring stain upon national life from the time of European occupation in 1788 through to today's egregious treatment of those de desperately seeking asylum. It's important that knowledge of this past informs our thinking and our decision-making in the present, not because the past is a reliable guide to present action, 
but because the perspective of history helps us better understand our lives and our communities and to work for a more tolerant future. Thanks.